Okay, awesome. Well, so thanks. First of all, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity to, to speak to you all today. Um, I realize I, I might have to apologize right now for the title because I don't really know what you think you know. So it's uh, presumptuous of me to say that you may not know what you think you know. Um, but I hope I'll be able to clarify something about the prescribed fire effects on at least particular forest type. And I'm going to focus on longleaf pine work that we've been doing in our group. I work um, out of the Athens Fire Lab, the Athens Prescribed Fire Lab with Joe O'Brien and his crew. And uh, we've been working on uh, these particular plots and some of these particular questions for coming up on 20 years now. So um, I think we're trying to, we're, we're finally getting to the point where we're beginning to really understand what's going on. Um, and, and the reason for the title is that we didn't really know what we thought we knew um, with regard to prescribed fire, because I think a lot of people have the impression that when you um, when you burn fuels in forest floor and and uh, and live fuels and such, you're actually contributing CO2. You're moving carbon out of the system through smoke and combustion, right? And so that makes sense intuitively. But I think that I hope Joe convinced you that fire um, and the way fire moves through a few particular fuel bed um, can be quite a bit more complex than just um, may meet the eye, I guess is what I would say. And so I am out of the Athens prescribed fire lab. I'm a, I'm a Georgia boy. I grew up in North Georgia, um, but my people, I have, a, I have a, an affinity for Alabama because a lot of my people came from the Sylvania and Valley Head area up there in the Northeast corner of Alabama. Um, so it is really a pleasure for me to talk to y'all today, and I hope you'll find this interesting. So I'll first, I don't know um, kind of where, what our starting point is, but I'm going to give a little bit of a brief um, review on some soil science and hope that that'll help us put fire effects on soil into context. And then I'll just give an introduction, introduction to some of our past and more current studies that's going on in the Athens Prescribed Fire Lab. And then uh, talk, a, talk a little bit about some of the lingering questions and what we have planned for the future. So by way of soil science, um, soil science review, I don't know how many of y'all have been exposed to a, a soil science class. I started out my training, uh, my graduate training anyway, as a student, master's student in the crop and soil science department at University of Georgia. Um, and so I got steeped in soil science. And so some of the very best or the mo most seminal work in soil science comes from this professor Hans Yenny, who worked for the uh, NRCS or what was eventually the NRCS for almost 50 years. And he's very famous for coming up with this equation, the soil formation factors. And so we think about soil formation as being a function or an interaction between these things. And it's, it's shortened into um, maybe not the best acronym in the world, but chlorate, okay? And so the CL stands for climate, the O stands for organisms. And in the case of soil formation, we think about organisms both as being plant organisms so in, in much in the way that uh, Dr. Alexander was talking about earlier, you know, the type of tree that is present can strongly influence and feed back into soil processes. But it, organisms are also things like fungi and bacteria that do decomposition and then larger organisms like earthworms and ants and termites and those kinds of things. So we know that um, the combination of those organisms in, in association with climate can strongly influence what kind of soil is going to be developed in a particular place. Also important is relief or topography. So whether you're in a mountainous uh, region or a, more of a plain type region can really influence how soil formation proceeds. And then parent material is important. Are you on uh, sedimentary rock? Are you on igneous rock? and so on and so forth. Maybe you're in a depositional environment where LUS is the primary parent material or sand or these kinds of things. And then the T stands for time. Of course, everything takes time and soil formation in particular um, is one of the things that can take quite a bit of time. And so the longer uh, a particular climate organism relief parent material combination has been in place, um, that influences and, and weathering and these kinds of things, that influences what soils um, result 
And more and more frequently, um, they added, so Yeni first came up with this formulation and did not include human, um, the human influence, but it has become pretty apparent over time. If you fly over the Midwest, for example, um, you can see very clearly the human influence on soils. And I would argue that the human influence on soils in the southeastern US with particular reference to fire has been ongoing for nearly 10,000 years. So it's important not to overlook the human influence when we talk about soil formation. All right, so a little bit more review. We're going to go a little bit more in depth. So when you have all those um, soil formation factors interacting and influencing a particular spot of ground, um, what generally results is these so-called genetic horizons. So these are the, the horizons of soil that will, de that will develop um, under the influence of those factors. And so they're generally categorized as having that black line, the heavy black line that goes horizontally is the soil surface. And above that is the O horizon, which is composed of mostly organic matter. And that again is what um, Dr. Alexander was talking about in her presentation primarily is, you know, what happens in terms of interactions and development of that O horizon. And then stuff that happens on the O horizon feeds into the A horizon. So you get material leached out of the O horizon or broken up into fine particles and that gets worked into the A horizon. But the A horizon is primarily mineral, um, composed of mineral components. And that would be sand, silt, and clay particles, which is also variable depending on all those other factors. And then as you move down through the profile, you get typically you'll get an E horizon, which is one of eluviation where materials have been leached out, and then they get deposited into a B horizon. And that could be clay particles or it could be organic matter particles. Uh, and it all depends on the overstory vegetation and um, the other factors. And so when you get further down, you talk about C and R horizons, which are basically um, the parent material. So for our purposes and for the purposes of a discussion about um, prescribed fire, it's really pretty much of an O horizon show, right? So we think about the O horizon as being a really important fuel, uh, a really important component of the fuel when talking about prescribed fires and wildfires. And so Soil science people like myself break it down into three separate horizons within the O, within the o horizon. You look over there on the right hand side and you can see um, how USDA uh, soil survey would designate these sub horizons. So you've got the OI, which is the brand new litter that's recognizable as you could even pick up a piece and probably tell what species it came from. And then the OE horizon is partially decomposed material um, and so that's either fragmented or in the European system, the F layer or the fragmented or fermentation layer. And so that's still recognizable as leaf material, but it might be a little bit more challenging to tell what species um, the material came from. And then below that, you've got the OA horizon, which is cozied up right next to the, um, the mineral soil, the mineral soil horizons. And this is so decomposed that you can barely, I mean, it's basically just what we would call humus. Um, and so in the, in the European system, those are L, F, and H. In the USDA system, it's O, I, O, E, and O, A. And probably in the parlance of most foresters, um, that O, E, and O, A would be called duff. So I've got those bracketed there on the left-hand side. And then everything above that would just be leaf litter. All of those are fuel or uh, are at least combustible depending on moisture condition. All right, so the big question here is in my mind, I guess, and maybe in your mind too, is why should you even care about soil carbon um, and how our management activities influence soil carbon? I, I hope I don't have to convince you that it is something that you should care about. Um, but in particular, you should care about the soil. And I would say that to you because soil has been demonstrated clearly to be the very largest terrestrial pool of carbon. So on earth, most of the carbon that is in dry land is stored in the soil. And so any activities that we do, any management activities that we perform 
uh, that have a possibility of influencing soil carbon, I think it's, it would behoove us to, um, to have a good understanding of what's happening within that soil pool. And so I just show you this, these global maps here, which show the one on top shows the uh, density of soil organic carbon. And so you can see in the southeastern US, relative to other places, that density is pretty low, but it's still um, higher than in some other places. And is what it suggests is that we've got a greater fraction of the total residing in vegetation, but there's still 40, you know, 25 to 40%, 25 to 50% of the total soil carbon resides in the, or the total carbon resides in the soil. All right, so what I would like to do, and this is a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm glad that this is echoing some of what Dr. Alexander was talking about earlier. We're, we're singing out of the same hymnal as my grandfather would say. Um, so when she was talking about how all of those different things like climate and the tree species composition and um, and time and so forth influence the soil, uh, the, the forests, forest floor horizons, which I think of as being a, a component of the soil, of course, as in O horizon. Um, we, can, we can actually um, adapt our thinking from the Hans Jenny soil formation factors to the, the fire effects factors, right? So depending on the climate and the tree species involved and topography and how long it's been since the last fire and whether or not humans have influenced um, the ignitions over, over historical time or current time, um, all of these things will combine to, um, to dictate what the fire effect is gonna be on a particular soil. And so I think that um, if we think about this, this function um, of, these, of these various things, I think parent material, we could probably take out of the fire effects um, equation, but even parent material could be, we could make a case for it because parent material to an extent dictates what kinds of, uh, whoops, what kinds of organisms will be present um, and so forth. So I think that if we, if we can adapt our thinking uh, about fire effects on soil into this framework of the chlorupt model with particular emphasis on the time and the human component, um, we can begin to develop a, a reasonable theoretical framework for understanding fire effects on soil. All right, you've already seen this. I'm again. I'm. I would say we're singing from the same hymnal here. Um, this this model here, that was presented by first by Guyette um, and his colleagues. This 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 map basically shows the potential for fire return, right? So what it takes into account is the climate and the vegetation, and this is independent of ignition sources, right? This is just the chemistry of the vegetation, the amount of vegetation and the prevailing climate and how that contributes to general flammability. So how often can fire return if, if there was no limitation on ignitions? How often could this area burn given the amount of fuel that is being produced? And so you can see that the entire Southeast um, is in that kind of orange and red and rust color belt. And those, if you can see the, the um, if you can see the, legend down there, those are fire return intervals on the order of less than two every two years to, you know, five to 10 years, five to eight years. Um, so in other words, the vegetation in the southeastern US is extremely susceptible, and in fact, probably even promotes the frequent return of fire. And so you can see that borne out if you look at the data for um, the occurrence of wildfire versus the occurrence of prescribed fire. And I, I will go back to that first, first one. So if you look out west, you see the fire return intervals are much longer, kind of those darker blue and purple colors are much longer fire return intervals. So if you look at that on, on the western part of the US, so this left-hand side is the area burned by wildfires. Whereas if you look over here, um, and we'll go back again and look at that 
frequent frequency of fire potential. And you can see that the people in the southeast have an inherent and intuitive understanding of that. And so they have applied fire as a management tool. This is uh, this data is from 2018. And so you can see that it's more than a million acres being burned in Georgia and Alabama and Florida. Um, and so I think that that show and, and that shows that the people and the land managers in the southeast understand that if they don't burn it frequently, then you might have a problem similar to what we observe out here in the west where they burn very little in terms of prescribed fire, but they get a lot of wildfires. Um, so I think that the people of Georgia and Alabama and Florida should be proud of their, um, I, I think it's probably part of the heritage really, and dating back to interactions with the first people who were here, the Native Americans and the early colonists and um, sort of technology transfer that, that happened between those two groups back in the 16, 1700s. Um, and again, so being proud of Georgia and Alabama and Florida, I'm most proud of Georgia having grown up in Georgia. And I feel like right now would be maybe an appropriate time for me to slip in a, uh, a go dogs or something like that. So I don't know if there's any football fans out there, but it looks like it's gonna be a heck of a football season to watch. I think maybe the folks in Alabama and Florida are not that excited about the go dogs, but I hope that you can all agree that it's a good thing that we beat Clemson on Saturday. Uh, all right, so let's move on to a little bit of uh, the work that we've been doing in the Prescribed Fire Lab in Athens for almost 20 years now. And I'll take you down to a longleaf pine forest on the Olusti Experimental Forest, which is part of the Osceola National Forest there in Northeastern Florida. So from Auburn, you would drive about 70 miles south and then turn right, I guess. <laughs> No, I guess from Auburn, you'd be turning left and you'd drive about 120 miles and you would be there. Um, so what we have in established in the Olusti Experimental Forest is a very long term, in terms of uh, long term studies, I, I believe that this is probably the very longest running uh, fire frequency experiment in the US, at least, if not in the world. And so what we've done there is we've established these, these plots and they're fairly good sized plots. They're about um, two acres a piece. Each one of those uh, blocks is about, each one of the plots is about two acres each. And they're arranged in an experimental design where um, the, the plots were burned annually or every two years or every four years or left unburned. And the, and the study started in 1958. So it's been running continuously for 62 years now. And we think that it's real, a real uh, diamond in the a, a crown jewel in our experimental forest network in terms of long-term studies. So that's a little bit of a, an intro. So the pictures up top show what that treatment has resulted in. The one on the left is an annually burned plot. The one in the middle is a four-year burn plot. And those palmettos are probably about mid thigh high. And then on the right hand side is one of the plots that has not been burned for the last 62 years. And that palmetto is, you can't really get a good feel for the scale, but that palmetto uh, rough there is over my head and I'm over six feet tall. All right, so the objectives of this long-term study to begin with back in the 50s when they started it, they wanted to monitor vegetation responses to different fire frequencies. And they really had an emphasis on pine production. So there was this idea that if you burned it too often, you would decrease the amount of, of uh, timber production potential of a place. And so that was the real um, initial focus of this study. But more recently, we um, initiated, and when I say more recently, this is 20 years ago, so about 45 years into the study, um, we initiated studies on carbon cycling with an emphasis on long-term storage patterns associated with the different fire management regime, regimes because people are becoming increasingly interested in, um, in carbon dynamics because as we all know, the concentration of carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere. And that has pretty negative consequences for the long-term climate prospects um, of the planet. 
And so if there's things we can do on a large scale, on a landscape scale that will influence the carbon balance and the carbon budget for land areas, then we should try to do that. And the only way to do that is to have a good understanding of what's happening. So um, when, when I say we initiated these studies, we started out with a fairly simple objective, which was to measure some selected pools and fluxes of soil carbon. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what the definition of those pools and fluxes are, but we specifically wanted to um, take into account the total amount of carbon being stored in the soil. And then we wanted to assay the amount of black carbon, which is charcoal and soot. And the reason why we're interested in that is because that particular pool of carbon, once it gets into the soil, it tends to stay there for very long periods of time. And so it can be thought of as a, a sequestration pool of carbon. And then we wanted to measure soil respiration because that respiration, which takes place as a result of roots doing their metabolism and then the microbes, fungi and bacteria and the other organisms that live in soil, they all are processing soil organic matter in various ways and their respiration con contributes to the loss of CO2 from, um, from the environment as well, from the soil environment as well. So we basically wanted to do a very simple um, and limited accounting of the carbon that's going in and out of this system. And so the picture shows me as a much younger man uh, taking soil cores and our colleague Ralph DeCosti, who was a postdoc in the unit at the time, who was leading up the chemistry part of this work. So to help put this into context, I wanted to present this little box and arrow diagram here, which is a way that we can think about the, the carbon cycle in terms of the pools and fluxes. So if you think about pools, all of the boxes on this diagram represent various pools of carbon or CO2 in this case, uh, well, carbon for, in particular, and the arrows represent fluxes. So we start out with the biggest pool, which is atmospheric CO2. And atmospheric CO2 gets fixed into live plants through um, photosynthesis. And those plants contribute to the root pool, and this is the above ground plant biomass. They, those contribute to the live roots, which when they die, contribute to soil organic matter. The litter that gets produced gets put into this detrital biomass, or what we would call what I've been talking about so far as forest floor or O horizon. And then that decomposes and contributes to the soil organic matter uh, pool. And so what we really want to try to understand is what happens to this, this amount of material, how much of that gets contributed, gets converted to CO2 and returns back to the atmosphere when you have a fire, and how much of it gets deposited in this organic matter pool. And this little box here, the darker box to the right-hand side of the organic matter, soil organic matter pool, is meant to represent um, black carbon or charcoal or soot that gets deposited when we have fires. Okay, so I also I already mentioned that roots and organic matter can contribute to the overall soil respiration, which gets returned to atmospheric CO2. So you can see that we've got a cycle here. And what we're most interested in is kind of the amount of carbon that gets stored in the various pools like plant biomass and detrital biomass or forest floor biomass, roots and organic matter. So what we did was we went and took soil cores from all the various horizons of those soils in the annually burned, the four year fire return interval plots and from the unburned plots, which at that time had been unburned for 45 or 50 years. And so when you divvy that up into the various horizons, you can see that in the reference pools, uh, in the reference plots, you've got this greenish and the and the darker blue up here on top, those represent the organic horizon. So you get a tremendous amount of buildup of organic matter in those, or, in those or, or carbon, straight carbon in those organic horizons, right? In the four-year um, plots, you still have an organic horizon, but it's much smaller than the one in the, uh, in the reference plots. And in the annually burned plots, it's no surprise, right, that we have very little in the way of organic horizon. And, um, but interestingly, and coincidentally, we would say, uh, 
Um, you do have in this A horizon, this is mineral soil, you have a tremendous amount of carbon being stored in that A horizon in the annually burned plots. So we ask ourselves the question, what would happen if there was gonna, if there was eventually a fire? And I think that I probably don't have to convince any of you that in a longleaf pine system that has a buildup of fuel like we're seeing in these reference plots, there will eventually be a fire. And so when that inevitable fire occurs, it's probably happening because wildfire conditions are good, which means that we'll get really high consumption rates of the organic horizons and soils. And so when that burns, that stuff is removed and departs the system or returns to the atmospheric pool as CO2. So I've drawn the red line here, which represents what's left in the reference plots after a fire. And you can see that the total amount of carbon in those plots is actually less than what you would have in the four-year return interval or in the one-year return interval plots. So we think this is a pretty interesting result if you uh, buy into the argument that fire is inevitable in those unburned stands. So then we looked at black carbon, another pool that we looked at. And again, this is probably um, no big surprise, right? That if you burn a plot annually, you're gonna have more black carbon represented in the soil pool than you would in a plot that had not been burned for 60 years. And so when we looked at this, we did indeed find, you know, more than double the amount of black carbon in the annually burned plots relative to the four-year burned plots. So then we looked at one of the fluxes, which is respiration from these plots. And so what respiration, what, the way we did that is we just put a collar on the soil surface and measured the buildup of carbon dioxide. And in the one-year plots, we had um, respiration that was comparable to that of the reference plots. But in the four-year plots, we had a significantly decreased amount of respiration, which means that for whatever reason, the soil microbes in those plots, whether it's because of the, the root composition, uh, because we know vegetation changes dramatically between those two, um, or whether it has to do with how the microbes deal with the environment that's presented by the four-year burns or whatever, we still found this significant difference and, and a decrease in respiration. So that's a net decrease in efflux from these four-year plots. So if we combine those results and we make some back of the envelope calculations, which you might, it could, it could also be translated as arm waving, um, and we make a few assumptions about the rates of, um, about those respiration rates um, actually extending out for the entire lifetime of the burn cycle. Um, it seems that the two to four year return intervals should maximize the total system carbon storage, which is a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because we think that fire is a source of CO2 but it turns out that that's only if fire is infrequent in longleaf pine systems. The frequent fires turned out, at least based on our data, to store more carbon than infrequent fires. All right, so once we got that stuff established, we decided that we needed to take a finer look at some of the processes and the actual rates of formation of the things that we're trying to talk about here. And so we initiated a series of more detailed studies to examine the role of prescribed fire and soil carbon in, in longleaf pine. Um, and so we hired on this guy, Dexter Struther, who worked at Georgia, um, University of Georgia, to get a PhD in ecology and fire ecology. And he worked very closely with Joe O'Brien and myself and Louise Laudermilk and uh, Nina Wurzberger, who's on the faculty at Georgia, along with a faculty member, uh, Cosma Naka at the University or at Alabama A&M University. So he's got Alabama A&M ties as well. Um, and so he worked on this project uh, where we really delved into the black carbon uh, question. And so black carbon is, is char and soot and it results from incomplete combustion of fuels, um, in, uh, fossil fuels, biofuels and biomass. And so this is basically what we would call charcoal, charcoal and soot. And it spans a, a formation spectrum from things like this. Uh, I don't know if y'all can see my cursor or not, but there's you know, it can form very um, inconsistent lattices where it's, it's not, um, this is partially charred material. And then when those lattices get organized uh, 
Um, then you start getting the formation of things like charcoal, and then this little this little spherical, half spherical thing down here is what happens when these particles condense together and form soot in the atmosphere, and those get deposited on the soil surface as well. So you can see that depending on how these things are formed and which type of formation you get, it could really influence the way these things are going to be behave in soil. So we'll go back to our old uh, stylized carbon cycle, and I'm just going to show you bl blanked out the parts that we're not talking about right now. And we really decided we were going to focus in hard on this portion of the, of the uh, cycle. And so if you look at that, um, we, can, we can make another box and arrow diagram where we're really trying to focus in on live fuel and dead fuel on the soil surface and maybe um, a little bit perched above the soil surface. And we want to look at the formation and the flux of black carbon and pyrogenic carbon into soil organic matter pools, whether they be um, the soil surface or deeper into the mineral horizons of soil. And so in this diagram, the P represents photosynthesis, which is a flux into live fuel. The Fs represent fluxes out of those fuel pools into the atmosphere and respiration, of course, is happening. Uh, but inside these red dashed boxes is really what Dexter's um, dissertation research focused on. So we did this work. We went back to our old uh, long-term fire plots at the Olesti, which you all should be familiar with by now. And we, we did um, some very intensive fuel sampling. So we looked at fuel, uh, above ground fuel, live and dead um, pool sizes were by doing clip plots. And then this, this picture in the bottom right, you can see that we have slid a little, uh, what it is is a baking sheet that's full of sterilized sand. We slipped that under the fuel bed, including what was on the forest floor. And as the fire moved over that, everything that burned and was deposited into, the, um, into that pan, we were able to collect. And we could then determine the amount of material that um, pyrogenic sea and black sea uh, that was deposited on the surface of that pan. And so when we did that, we took, all, we took this sand back to the lab and we analyzed it for pi C and uh, black carbon using this digestion method, which we can go into more detail about later if anybody's interested. Um, so here's, here's some results. This is just fuel loading data. And not surprisingly, if you look at um, the fuel loading based on those um, uh, fire return intervals, you can see that the one for live fuel, the biggest difference was the amount of live palmetto stems and leaves that were present. And it came to, you know, 11 or 12 tons per acre in the uh, four year plots and less than four tons per acre in the one year plots. This was a statistically significant difference. The other fuel categories were none of them were statistically significant. Um, so we think in the live fuel, it's palmetto, a palmetto show primarily. Um, then you look at dead fuel, pine litter um, was, was the big main contributor. And again, it's no surprise that if you don't burn it for 60 years, you're going to have more, or if you don't burn it for four years, you're going to have more pine litter buildup than if you burn it every year. And that was a statistically significant. And then there was another statistical difference in the amount of fragmented litter in these plots and in the dead palmetto stems or dead palmetto litter that was on the soil surface. Um, so if you add these all up, you end up with quite a few more tons per acre of palmetto fuels um, than you do um, the other fuels between four-year plots and one-year plots. So what does it mean when you burn that? So when we collected our pans, we found that the amount of pyrogenic C, which is which is non-black carbon. So that's basically lightly charred material that doesn't qualify or, or fall out in our analysis as black carbon. There was no difference whatsoever between the one year, two year and four year plots for pyrogenic C. And there was no difference whatsoever in the production of black carbon between the one year, two year and four year plots. Um, and you know, when we first looked at this data, we were a little bit uh, un, unsatisfied. We were a little bit disappointed that um, there were no differences because we because we fully expected that there were. And so we started doing a little bit more thinking and it, we, it occurred to us that these are the results from one fire. And if you if you really want to get an estimate, you got to think about the entire four year cycle. 
because these one-year plots are going to do this every year, right? So if you do this on a four-year basis and you look at the amount of pyrogenic C that's produced over four years in the one-year plots, it is almost three times more than you get in the four-year plots. And the same story for the black carbon, right? So we got to consider what happens over the four-year cycle because fires, some fires are more frequent than others, right? So here's the conclusions we have from Dexter's work and his dissertation work was a lot more complex and um, there were more components to it than I was able to present here today. But um, we feel like we have a better handle on the rates of, of BC formation and production depending on fire frequency and fuel loading. And we know now that interactions between fuel loading and fuel types and fire behavior really seem to influence black carbon production so that similar amounts are produced on a per fire basis but if you look at it on a four year basis or the entire cycle basis, annual fires produce the mo most black carbon, which should equate to the most long term storage of carbon in those soils, which matches up with the earlier data that we produced from our first work. So future directions, we're going to bore in even more and start looking at the fluxes uh, from dead fuel into the organic matter and from the black carbon pool out into respiration pools. We're gonna look at how carbon leaches out of the organic matter pool and out of the black carbon pool. Um, and this dotted box around the black carbon pool, we're gonna to try to look at what influences the size and composition of the black carbon pool. And when we really start boring into it, we wanna ask questions about how these different forms of black carbon, say soot particles versus charcoal particles versus lightly charred material, how does that behave and how do those things um, influence the fluxes into and out of the long-term storage pools. And so I don't know really how I'm doing on time, but I think that that's pretty close to uh, what was allotted for this presentation. I, I really appreciate the opportunity again. And if you have any questions, you can reach me or we can talk about them now, or you can get uh, the email address there with thanks to that list of uh, folks who primarily work out of the Athens Prescribed Fire Lab. Great presentation, Mac. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So, all right. Um, first question up is um, any correlation to KBDI and carbon release and quote, soil carbon release? Um, not, that, not that I know has been quantified, but the answer is most certainly yes. Um, so one of, one of the chapters in, in Dexter Struthers' dissertation was, um, was looking at how fuel moisture, so, so he set up some small scale plots where he burned um, pine litter that had different moisture contents and we looked at the BC production from those, looking at uh, backing fires and head fires um, and so forth. And really, you know, again, kind of surprisingly, the, the, the conditions that we tested in that experiment didn't really seem to make an influence on BC production. But I think that that needs to be taken in the field and we need to be able to take into account um, because that was just straight pine litter. We didn't have any duff in the equation for that study. Um, so I think that, that duff and the relationship between the moisture and the duff is certainly going to influence the, the production of that stuff. We just need to we need to get out in the field and quantify it. So that's another future direction. Understand. Thank you. Um, Kevin Robertson clarified where clerked came from and the conspiracy behind it. Uh, you can read up on that a little bit later. Um, there was a little bit of discussion on the age of the uh, fire plots kicking around several different locations. Uh, Kevin asked, how is the black carbon being measured? I think you covered that. Yeah, it's, so it's, a, the, so it's a, an operational definition for black carbon. And we take, we take the material into the lab and we subject it to um, a boiling acid digestion. It's a double acid digestion. And I wish, I wish Dexter was here because he could answer this a lot better than I can. He and uh, Bayon Sheko did all the chemistry work. But essentially it's, it, um, it's operationally defined as the carbon that's left over after the sample has been subjected to a hot acid digestion. So the acid will burn off the material that is um, more labile, I guess you would call it, more, more susceptible to being digested. 
And the stuff that is unsusceptible or that's, that's resistant to digestion is what we operationally defined as black carbon. And that's a whole, that definition is a whole other ball of wax. And it's, uh, you know, it kind of depends on which camp you're in as to whether or not that's a good definition, but that's the one we picked. All right, thank you, Mac.